thanks very much and welcome to meet up. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, taking the Excuse time. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Casper, for inviting me. Um, and today we will talk about uh, not only the funding sources for uh, businesses, for industry, that uh, basically reach out and uh, you know, go beyond the SBR program. I'm a director of business development at the Freemind Group. And I guess just before we begin, uh, just a show of hands, who here has never ever submitted a grant? or has been involved in submitting a grant. Okay, so this is wonderful. Uh, how many of you submitted SBIRs? Okay, how many submitted non-SBIR grants? Okay, now the tricky question. How, how many of you submitted non-SBIR grants for or as a part of an industry research? Okay, wonderful. Okay, so, uh, so this is a... Welcome, everyone. Um, a bit about FreeMind, just uh, before we begin, uh, to explain uh, what it is that we were invited to talk today. We've been around uh, for about 18 years now, since 1999. We have uh, about 60 full-time employees and a very diverse client base. Uh, first of all, a lot of academic institutes, big research institutes, but we do most of our work with the industry. So we uh, do, uh, as Casper said, uh, only life science uh, related work. Um, we work with very small companies, uh, one or two people just fresh out of uh, college with a great idea. Uh, some of the large names as well, Big Pharma, of course. Uh, we submit around 500 grants and government projects uh, on behalf of our client base every year and uh, help our clients win about $100 million in awards uh, per year. Sometimes more. And uh, today, uh, I guess the, the, the first thing that I would like to, to get out of the way is a common misconception that if you have a startup, if you have a business, all you can do in terms of non dilutive funding is submit SBIR or STTR grants. Uh, that is absolutely not true. The SBIR STTR program is a great program. Uh, we love SBIRs, we win SBIRs. But that's just you know the tip of the iceberg, and that is uh, what we'll be addressing today. So, uh, very generally speaking, uh, when we're talking about non dilutive funding sources that come from the U.S., we're talking about a fifty billion dollar pool every year. Most of it comes from within the NIH, uh, and the NIH, of course, and, and I'm sure you all know the NIH is basically a combination of twenty seven institutes and centers. I uh, have some uh, letters there. Uh, that I do hope that you recognize. There are other HSS organizations such as BARDA, which is the Biomedical Research and Development Authority. We have the FDA, we have the CDC, we have the National Science, Science Foundation that do a lot of work uh, with companies, both uh, as a part of their SBIR program, but other programs as well. We have the Department of Defense, the DOD. Uh, and within that, we have uh, the US Army, we have DARPA, DITRA, the Congressly Directed Medical Research Programs, uh, and of course, private foundations as well. There are so many private foundations. So basically, any research topic that you can come up with probably has uh, some kind of private foundation uh, to look to. Some of the main ones are the Michael J. Fox Foundation, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and of course, many more. And in terms of uh, the scope of work that these agencies uh, fund, they basically uh, do everything from very, very early stage uh, type work, no preliminary data, just a wonderful idea, all the way up to very, very late stages. So even if you think that you do not have enough to start, even if you think that you're already in clinical uh, development and uh, you know this is uh, out of their league, uh, think again, there's definitely a lot to do uh, for all stages of development. And if we'll talk about the size of the award, so for early stages, uh, we can roughly say that the awards range from two to $500,000. More advanced stages, still for clinical or early stage clinical, half a million to about three and a half. 
But if you move up to more advanced stages, uh, it can be much more than that. And by much more than that, I'm talking uh, more than $100 million in awards uh, per, re uh, per project. Uh, these amounts are definitely out there. The important thing to think about is that it has to reflect the scope of work that you're suggesting. Another way to look at it uh, is through the different, uh, I guess within the different stages there are a different number of opportunities. So when we're talking about very early stages, there are a lot of opportunities out there, much more variety, uh, but the success rates are lower, mostly because a lot of people that are not very experienced, did not really think this through, just started submitting. It doesn't mean that if you have a very early stage project and you're submitting, your chances are low if you are good. So this, this is definitely something to bear in mind. As you progress, as you, sorry, as you move on and um, uh, submit projects that are more advanced, the success rates are much higher. It's, it's pretty, uh, I guess, intuitive if you think about it. You cannot uh, submit a phase two clinical trial if you do not know what you're doing and if you're not experienced. So the success rates definitely um, uh, definitely range if you compare the different stages of development. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to zoom in to the NIH budget for 2017. Uh, Trump just increased it with over $2 billion. Mm -hmm. But the more important, uh, I guess, uh, piece of information that I would like you to know is that most of that goes out to fund extramural research. So for 2017, we're talking <coughs> $28 billion just to fund projects. And if we'll zoom into that even uh, even further, uh, this is the categorical spending of the NIH for 2017. $6 billion for oncology, another $6 billion uh, for um, neuro uh, indications, infectious diseases definitely. Uh, but the take home message here from this graph, and, and I'm sure it's not, uh, don't, don't read everything, it's not, that's not the point. But the point is that any project that you can come up with within the field of life, life sciences will probably be funded by the NIH in terms of their uh, scope of interest. So uh, if you do not do something involving oncology, that does not mean that the NIH is not the right uh, place for you. And um, a few uh, statistics. So research grants, uh, for for-profit uh, organizations within the U.S. domestic organizations, you can see that definitely the NIH has a pretty significant portion of it. But having said that, a lot of the money comes from other sources as well. So it is very important to reach out and try and find out what else is there, uh, excluding the NIH. Uh, another something uh, that I would like to show you is that out of um, these awards. Some of them definitely come from R&D, from, uh, sorry, research grants, but there is a very significant portion coming up from non-grant uh, type of awards. Government contracts, broad agency announcements. These are definitely uh, significant amounts of money. <coughs> and uh, definitely, you know, the, the, the reason that a lot of you know the SBIR and not other things is that most of the industry funds itself through the SPR STTR program. The thing is that uh, it doesn't have to be like that. Although the SPR STTR programs are wonderful, they only have a fixed pie of a little over 3% of the entire budget of these agencies by law. It will never be more than that. But everything else, the entire amount is definitely open for businesses um, and that is what we'll be uh, discussing today. So um, the reason that uh, Freeman, the reason that we feel that uh, research groups that are from the industry need to focus on non dilutive funding is that a dollar one through these types of mechanisms is worth much more than a dollar. The Milken Institute showed that for every dollar one through these non dilutive funding sources, government sources, a company within the next eight years or so is uh, likely to win $8.38 <coughs> .8 from the private sector. So this is definitely something to bear in mind. Uh, another thing that's interesting is that historically, 50% of all FDA approved drugs received government funding at some point during the course of their R&D activities. 
making non-dilutive funds, even if we're talking about a very small amount, a very good indicator for investors to know whether or not your, uh, your drug, your work will be successful or not. And they do look at that. Even if you're saying, you know what, what will I do with $200,000? That's not a very significant amount of money, especially in biology. Uh, it is very important. It'll also be important in the future when you'll go into the investors meetings and say, you know what, the NIH backed me up. The DOD backed me up. The NSF thinks I'm great. And um, definitely, you know, we're not saying do only that. Uh, there are other sources of funding. We definitely uh, advocate a very balanced campaign. But you cannot leave out non dilutive funding from, uh, from your marketing, from uh, your funding uh, efforts. Especially, um, and this is again a common misconception that we hear. First of all, it takes a lot of time. And it is very time consuming and that's, of course, that, that costs a lot of money as well. But if you compare it to the VC, to the private sector, it's actually cheaper. The amount of time that takes from submission to awards, even with the non-SBRs, even in the DOD contracts, is still uh, relatively shorter than uh, the other sources that, that uh, I mentioned before, the VCs, the angels. These things take time as well. Can you guys see? So I wanted to show you a few examples uh, from some of our, um, I don't want to say our success stories because we've done nothing, uh, but some success stories that we were fortunate enough uh, to see up close. So the first one is a company called Cubist. Uh, Cubist won um, quite a few of these awards. They heard about non of funding from two companies that they purchased, Trius and Optimer, both uh, clients of ours, that were very successful with non of funding. And when they were purchased by Trius, by Cubist, sorry, uh, they shared, uh, shared that information and Cubist said, okay, we want to do this too. So they started with uh, submissions. They uh, won a few grants from the NIH, and um, eventually, uh, you know, they caught the attention of uh, Merck, and they were purchased for a, a little, a little under uh, ten billion dollars. So of course, we're not saying that if you win NIH grants, you will be purchased by Merck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it will definitely uh, do you no harm. Uh, and it looks much better if they review you as a company and they see that you have the validation of these funding agencies, it will definitely uh, help. Another uh, interesting story that I would like to share is a company called um, NanoMR. They uh, were very successful in raising both a Series A and a Series B. And they uh, got to work, they were, they were very busy uh, the problem with raising money when you do work that is, well, expensive, that's just the case of it, um, that money runs out. And right when they got to the make or break point, they submitted a pre-application to BARDA. They were invited to submit the full application, and then they came to us and say, said, you know what, if we're not winning, if we're not going to win, that specific application, we can just you know shut down the lights and, and go home. We will not be able to to continue on, which is unfortunate because we know that we have something great. We really want to do it. We've been doing it for a few years now, uh, so please help us. And we say, okay, no pressure. That's uh, that's how we prefer it. Uh, we submitted the grant. We won the grant. Um, they were very 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 happy. Uh, it definitely enabled them to continue on. They then raised. Uh, a lot more and they are live and well today. So that's uh, example number two. Uh, the third one is a company called uh, MadBio. I'm not sure, uh, is, did anyone hear, hear about them before? MadBio? Okay. They are the company that uh, developed the treatment for Ebola a few years ago. They fund all of the work through these sources, through non <coughs> funding sources, all of these things in blue are uh, grants that they won. So of course this is a very extreme uh, example, but it is doable. <coughs> Companies can fund all of their activities with these sources, with these government sources, and I guarantee that they uh, do not rely on SBRs to do that. Um, so when we're talking about uh, types of submissions or funding routes, uh, we usually divide it into three. 
The first one is solicited applications, where you basically uh, see an opportunity for a specific topic. The second one is unsolicited opportunities or investigator initiated, for example, the R21, R1, SBIRs, of course. And the goal as you approach uh, that type of opportunity is to try and establish the interest prior to the submission. Making sure that you are submitting it to the right place, although it doesn't say, you know, breast cancer, which is your topic. And the third one is broad agency announcements or BAA. These are uh, large scale applications, government contracts, and this is definitely something uh, to think about. Just a minute. That you can cut out. Okay, so um, a bit about the NIH. Um, if you'll go into the NIH website and you'll see the number of applications, uh, opportunities, sorry, out there, uh, you'll see a little over a thousand. It says today, but it's actually from Monday, so maybe more. Uh, definitely the SBR and SCTR program. I will not go into that uh, as promised. Um, both are very important though. Both uh, the SBR and the SCTR. SBR are for small businesses. SCTR is when you collaborate with uh, some kind of academic institute. So these are the SBR solicitations just to make sure that everything is organized. Uh, two other very important mechanisms are the R01 and the R21, uh, considered very uh, appropriate for academics and a lot of uh, people that do wonderful scientific work outside of academia do not try and submit R01s and R21s, uh, which is very unfortunate because companies win R01s, companies win R21s. And a lot of the pushback that we hear when we say that is, you know what, we've looked it up. We do not see a lot of companies that win R01s or R21s. But uh, bear in mind that a lot of these projects do have some kind of academic collaborator. So if you're doing something with Princeton, I'm sure that you'll say, okay, my company is small, but they're Princeton. Let's just say Princeton as the PI. <coughs> but the work is ours, we do everything together. And then you look it up in the reporter and you see Princeton. That does not mean that Princeton did the work. So definitely look up R01s, look up R21s as well. Don't disregard these parent solicitations. Uh, about 70% of all funds that the NIH uh, distributes is through parent uh, R01s, R21s, and SBRs as well, by the way. Uh, this is the uh, R21 omnibus solicitation. Um, Again, exploratory development grant supports exploratory uh, and of developmental research. Uh, you can read that as well. Uh, a lot of agencies participate. Again, with the R01, slightly larger, uh, five-year project, uh, two and a half million dollars in direct cost, and in addition to that, you get overhead, typically about forty percent. So that definitely increases uh, the work that you do. Unlike the SBR program, by the way, that is capped. You know, they tell you. 225, and that includes everything. On top of these grants, you can also add in all of the indirect costs of your project. Your secretary, toilet paper, Diet Coke in the fridge. All of that is included, um, and th that's actually a pretty, pretty strong point uh, to think about when approaching these things. Um, and another thing that I would like to focus on a bit is the clinical stage funding opportunities. So uh, again, <coughs> phase two or fast track SBIRs, uh, R01s, the NIH also has a mechanism for clinical stage project planning. So uh, bear in mind that their goal is to fund you. Their goal is to fund your, the work that you do and they would like to help. So even before you go into the clinical stage, they would like to award you money uh, to be able to do that uh, appropriately. So that's that. Uh, there's the U01, uh, which is a larger scale project, a bit more hands-on, very helpful if you do feel that you need the guidance. Uh, UH2, UH3, this is basically when you're late stage preclinical and you want to take it from that stage to the early stage uh, clinic. <laughs> I just feel like you know I'm blocking the screen. For no, <laughs> Maytel, you'll be sharing the slides afterwards, Sorry? right? Oh. You'll be sharing yeah, yeah, the yeah. slide deck. Okay. So. Uh, 
so a few things uh, to bring in mind if you are going after clinical stage um, grants, uh, they do have a bit more requirements, obviously, to make sure that they are supporting work that uh, is done by people that are basically good to go. So uh, you do, do need a clinical protocol, of course. Um, you need an investigator for sure. You need to know what it is that you plan on doing. If you're planning a project that has 50 clinical sites, you need to know what the sites are, where they are, or at least be able to, to describe them very, very carefully. Of course, you can have half the application have the, you know, list a TBD, TBD, but that will probably not help you win the grant. Uh, something that is relatively new, but uh, is catching on, of course, with the NIH, but other uh, agencies as well, you do need an IND. You need to, to have that before the grant, you need to have that while you're submitting, and the change is that uh, it used to be, yeah. What is IND? IND is basically uh, when you talk to the FDA and they say, okay, you're ready to go to the clinic. Get the FDA. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course you need to be able to contact the program officers in advance. So a bit about uh, the review process of the NIH. Um, people think that it's a scientific uh, review process. That is not uh, entirely the case. Uh, as every investor, and, and you have to think of the NIH as an investor at this point, uh, they do a risk assessment process. They have to make sure that the risk or the money that they're investing will be definitely uh, will definitely go to the most appropriate people. So the review process and the review criteria are uh, are these. First of all, the most important thing is the scientific approach. What it is that you plan on doing with their money. Um, mostly because most of these grants, unlike the SBAR grants that are focused on businesses, these are the, the non-SBAR type of opportunities focus on the science. So then you really need to make sure that the science is solid, that you're asking a question that is important, that you're suggesting a solution that is very innovative. It, it's not just about asking the right question, it's about doing it in an exciting way. That is what they want to do. They want to advance exciting <coughs> science, innovative science. And that is why they will also award people that have very strong uh, leadership. So the people, the team that you'll, com that you'll uh, assemble for the, the project is also very much important. And uh, the last one is the environment. Where will you be uh, conducting the work? If you're uh, suggesting a very uh, microscopy-based experiment, and you do not have a microscope, that, that's unfortunate. I mean, they will not trust the fact that you'll be able to see the project through. Um, so that's the NIH. I would also like to talk a bit about BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. They um, basically, um, they, they have a pretty, pretty impressive budget. Um, they fund clinical stage projects. Uh, and the goal of BARDA, the, the, the agency itself, is um, to help the U.S. citizens be protected against uh, nuclear, chemical, biological uh, disasters as well. <coughs> and uh, they have three open solicitations. The first one is uh, basically to, to combat uh, pandemic influenza. Second one is for anything, again, development of chemical, biological, radiological, radiological and, and uh, nuclear medical countermeasures. That's the second one. And the th third one is for technology. <coughs> so devices, uh, if you have some kind of kit that helps you uh, identify uh, or you know, uh, diagnose uh, some kind of tropical disease, BARDA is, is definitely the place to go. <coughs> and uh, the review process with BARDA is uh, is, is basically a little different if you compare it to the NIH, and it's basically divided into two. The first stage is called the white paper, or the pre-application stage. If uh, you're starting a broader process, you'll start with submitting a very short summary of what it is that you plan on doing. And by short, we're talking about five pages long, sometimes 10. You send that over to them, and that is then reviewed. Only if they're interested, they'll invite you to submit a full application. You submit that, it's reviewed again, and then hopefully awarded. 
But bear in mind that one of the most important stages within the entire process is that white paper, is that pre-application. Because most applications don't make it through or make it past that stage. So first of all, um, yeah, critical, again, uh, it's about two pages long. Again, it can sometimes be up to 10, but it's a very, very short document. The majority, well, yeah, I've said about that already. Um, but you need to bear in mind that you have to be very careful while drafting uh, that type of, uh, of uh, application. And um, when you do, you have to make sure that you are able to, to show them what it is that you plan on doing, to show them that this is definitely something that they should back up. Uh, next up is the Department of Defense, uh, the DOD. They have quite a few programs uh, that we'll briefly talk about. Um, so, and yeah, so it has everything going. So, um, it is not very well known, unfortunately, but the DOD supports uh, scientific work that has something to do with combat-related situations, of course. But they also <laughs> take care of veterans and their family members. So if you do not have something in your pipeline that uh, resembles something that the Army can use, that does not mean that the DOD is not a good place for you uh, uh, to submit to. So, uh, and we'll go into some of that uh, later on. Uh, next up is the FDA. They also do uh, quite, a, f uh, quite a, a lot of work, funding work, the funding, uh, sorry, research, clinical state research. And uh, they do phase one, two, three, up to $2 million uh, orphan indications. So this is definitely something to bear in mind. Uh, the deadline is uh, in February 2018, sorry. Um, but uh, if you do anything that is considered an orphan indication, definitely uh, look, look them up. And another um, program that I would like to talk about is the CDMRP, or the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs. Um, they do a lot of work, uh, both preclinical and clinical. And I just, uh, just as an example, I showed you a few of the clinical stage funding. So basically, their scope is incredibly wide. Um, just a few examples. Uh, for uh, for uh, this year's uh, budget, they have a wonderful oncology program. They usually fund it with a little over three hundred million dollars every year. They have a very strong uh, breast cancer indication. They also have uh, a general oncology uh, program as well. A lot of uh, neuro-related um, indications. They have a general medical research program. $300 million as well, that funds so many topics, and, and we'll have that in the next slide as well, spinal cord or, uh, injury, vision, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, and generally speaking, anything neuro-degenerative uh, degenerative, uh, related is also very much funded by uh, by the DOD, by the CDMRP, yeah? By vision, you mean a display? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And sight, and eyes, and... Uh, And um, definitely uh, going through the website, uh, look it up. We do not like the CDMRP website. It is not a very stable one. It keeps uh, crashing. Uh, but when it's up, <laughs> uh, they have a lot of wonderful information um, uh, listed there. Now remember that everything is recorded. I am sorry, CDMRP. Your website is wonderful. <laughs> I love the internet. <laughs> so uh, here's the list of uh, the programs the CDMRP has for 2017. Um, yeah, you can just uh, read through the list. As I think so. But bear in mind that, for example, when I say general medical research, so these are the topics for the general medical research. You do not have to read all of that. Uh, my point is that there are so many things that these uh, these opportunities fund. Uh, you just have to be very careful and make sure that you are looking that up. 
And um, so as, as I've said uh, before, uh, you know, we are very much um, not only funding uh, enthusiasts. In Freemind, we definitely feel that a lot of people that should be funding the work, or at least trying to fund the work through these sources of funding, uh, don't, but you have to bear in mind that, of course, it cannot replace other, unfortunately, more conventional uh, <coughs> sources of funding as well. Definitely go after angels, go after the, the private sector as well, go after VCs, but you cannot uh, leave none of the funding out of that <coughs> equation. Uh, if we'll talk about, you know, what can you do to maximize your non the funding efforts. So first of all, um, the first step is to understand who these people are. Find out what they look to fund. And they are very good at just writing it down in the website, especially the CDMRP. But um, their goal is to fund you. Make sure that you understand exactly how, exactly what it is that they want to fund. Um, and you have to make sure that you do have a granting strategy that correlates with the actual work that you plan on doing. It doesn't make a lot of sense submitting a grant and suggesting work that is not really what you want to do. It will not be helpful for you. Um, before you begin, and, and this is actually something that uh, is, is not as intuitive as I would hope, uh, is to make sure that you are identifying everything that is relevant to you before you begin. I'm pretty sure that, and, and I do appreciate the fact that you all came here, I'm sure you are doing, you are very, very busy, you have a lot of things on your plate. Don't waste your time submitting a grant that will not be successful. Make sure that you're doing something that will help you win money. And um, most importantly, plan and execute a long-term multi-submission granting strategy. The amount of time uh, that takes, uh, let's just say, an average grant to be awarded is about eight months from submission to award. And unfortunately, uh, most submissions are not always successful. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that the work is not uh, important. It doesn't mean that you will not be funded. It just means that you basically can't give up. If you're talking about an investor, you will never go to one investor, hear a no, and then say, oh, okay, I'll be a waiter then. You have to understand that this takes time, which is okay. You wanna increase your chances, wonderful. Submit to five agencies. Submit multiple applications for each one, multiple deadlines. If you hear a no, that's also okay. Resubmit the application. Um, and another thing that um, is, is very important uh, is for you to remember that the application is reviewed by a very, very uh, experienced group of reviewers. So these people, they, they read and they read through hundreds of these every cycle. Their only goal is to be able to say whether or not you have a strong probability to be successful. Know your weaknesses, don't ignore them. They'll be able to see right through that. If you know that there's a strong competitor, write about them. I'm sure you think that you're better if you're devoting your life to this. Make sure that you explain that to them. That just lets them know that you understand where you are within the scope of your field. Um, another thing uh, that is important is to find the right partners if necessary. If you add into uh, your project as a partner, <coughs> as a co-investigator, even as a consultant, someone who is an expert in the work that you do, that just makes the work uh, and, and the team look stronger. If they look at the application, if they look at the team, they say, okay, these people will probably be able to get this done. Uh, and the reason that I'm emphasizing this uh, is because we do hear a lot of people saying, you know what, I don't want to add him to my team because they'll think I'm not good enough to do this myself. The opposite is true. A strong PI knows how to delegate. He knows how to cooperate with different parties within the industry, within academia. And uh, again, you have to know the interests of the agency 
and the mechanism. We talked about very different uh, pockets of money. Each one of them has a slightly different uh, emphasis. You have to understand the differences. SBIRs are very industry uh, related, very company related. If we're comparing them to R01s, they are more science related. Some uh, DOD applications have a section called military relevance. You have to remember <coughs> what it is that they're after and make sure that you're presenting it to them. And of course you can uh, very gently, you know, massage uh, the project to make sure that it fits. But that is usually not the right strategy if the goal here is to be successful and to win. You have to address uh, the non-important admin parts. Um, the reason that uh, I wrote non-important uh, is because it is actually critical. Um, so a, a bit about the, I guess, the, the administrative parts, uh, and I'll just take the NIH as an example. Um, usually it takes a company or organization about uh, three to four weeks to be completely ready to submit an NIH grant. You have to have a SEM account. You need to be able to have a grants.gov account. The PI needs to have an account. Uh, the other people within the application need to be able to be affiliated to that application. If you have two PIs, only one of them is registered, the other one is not registered, you cannot submit the application together, which is unfortunate because, um, well, in most cases, uh, you'll find out the night before, after you've spent three months writing a wonderful application. These things take time. <coughs> I don't know how many of you tried uh, preparing a stem.gov account. Show of hands. Wonderful. Okay. So you know that it is very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, coming from the, the professional department in Freemind, uh, I've done too many of them. Uh, it can get very complicated. You have to make sure that you're doing it correctly. You cannot disregard that part. Uh, so that's that. Uh, the submission as well, although uh, we have assist now, um, which makes life a bit easier. In, in uh, if you compare it uh, to the application package that uh, was only lately uh, replaced, um, and uh, well, just a, a bit of history. Uh, until about two years, you needed uh, a fax to be sent to the government before they. Uh, approve uh, the process itself. You have to know these things. They're not intuitive. Know the SF 424. That's the NIH guideline. Read it. Read the guidelines. Read everything. You don't do not want your application to be administrat administratively uh, sorry rejected because the font is wrong. And these things happen, and they've happened before. So make sure that you know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> And another thing that's important, of course, I know these are scientific projects, and I told you uh, that they are science, science, scientifically focused, sorry. But if you're presenting yourself as the PI, the project manager of the grant, you need to be able to show them that you have the experience to lead. Um, and uh, again, about a year, maybe two ago, the bio, the, the, the structure of the bio sketch within the NIH grants changed to make sure that you are able to explain better what makes you suitable to fund these things. Um, and uh, of course, do whatever you can to reduce the risk <coughs> of the NIH as uh, they review the grant. Um, so uh, just uh, very briefly, uh, what we do within that, uh, within that setting, um, what we do, the, the process that we do with our clients uh, is, again, to help them identify everything there is out there because it doesn't really make a lot of sense to get to work before you know what you're doing, before you know other things that you could be doing and devoting your time to. We help them create a multi-submission granting strategy to make sure that they have a work plan. And, and that's, I guess, that's, uh, that's uh, one of the most important uh, things here. You need to know what it is that you plan doing. How are you approaching the matter of non-dilutive funding? The money's there. 
it's real, it's wonderful. Uh, no equity, no matching funds. These things are not very common uh, uh, within the life science community, unfortunately. But this is good money. But you need to be able to utilize that, utilize these sources correctly. Uh, and of course, uh, make sure that you're submitting, of course, as many applications as possible, but you need to make sure that they are competitive. Submitting five applications that are not competitive will get you absolutely nowhere, unfortunately. Uh, so that's that. Uh, and this is me, and uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what free mind does and then how you interact with clients and what you are. Uh, I can. I'll do it uh, very briefly, Casper. <laughs> because. Uh, well, you have until one, and uh, so let, let's just uh, let's just do the talk until one, and then anybody who wants to can leave. Uh, you want to leave now? It's fine. Yeah. Also. Uh. Um. So what we do uh, when we take on a new client uh, is first of all have them talk to one of our client strategists, such as the Dr. Blue here. Uh, and the goal of that, even initial conversation, is to understand your needs. What you're looking for, what it is that you plan on doing, uh, assess the stage of the R&D, tasks we need to complete, dollar amount that you're talking about, and then link your interests to those of the funding agencies themselves. So we will talk to the program officers for you, get their feedback, uh, basically understand uh, what it is that they want and link your interests to those of the funding agency uh, agencies themselves. Uh, we then come back to you with the, the list of the most relevant opportunities and together we translate into the work plan, into the mortgage submission granting strategy. Once we have that, uh, we of course produce the applications together, execute on that strategy. We have a wonderful team of grant consultants. Uh, the draft templates for you based on the specific solicitation guidelines and our many years of experience in doing this uh, and basically uh, work on it together so definitely take the lead in all the administrative uh, parts um, but uh, even in the most hard percent of the parts where of course we'll need you involved uh, we take the lead make sure that everything you need is present within the application uh, submit it for you help you track it uh, but the most important uh, element is that we do our very best not to submit one application. The goal is really to submit as many applications and we encourage our clients to do that. Uh, submit multiple grants to multiple agencies, multiple deadlines, because although writing grants is, is wonderful, it's, it's a great hobby, and I'm sure you'll agree, uh, <laughs> The goal here is to be successful. And unfortunately, the best way we know uh, to do that is really to submit a lot of them. Don't be afraid of failing. If that happens, it means nothing. The worst thing that can happen is that you get a very, very detailed summary of what the reviewer is. And again, these are the top experts in your field. And you get a very, 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 very sometimes long list of what they think uh, summary of what they think about the work you do, the work that you plan. That is always useful. You can take that, you can uh, incorporate that into the application and submit again. But the worst thing that people can do uh, is, is to give up on the NIH and to give up on these sources of funding because they don't know them or because they feel intimidated when they see the guidelines. I, I that, uh, and just the other part of it that was, what's your own business model? What are you charging your clients? So uh, basically, it's a combination of uh, two components. I'm sorry, <laughs> we said that this will not be a commercial. Yes, it's, it's okay. It's a okay. question. So um, basically, there are two components. Uh, it, it's very success oriented to business model. We ask for a percentage of the grant, and there's a retainer component uh, to basically uh, allow us to work together for long periods of time. We usually begin with 12 months, uh, and that just enables us to work. Uh, you know, submit to multiple deadlines. The NIH, uh, they have six. The DOD has uh, one for the CDMRP if you're doing breast cancer, so two. But there is so much to do throughout the year. Um, and uh, yeah, that's I guess the combination of 